Hi, this is Wendy from Wendy's Classic Corner, and today we are in the beautiful Carnegie PA at the historic Andrew Carnegie Free Library. Do you know about the hidden gems that could be in your local library? Well, in the Andrew Carnegie Free Library, there is a historic surprise that you do not want to miss. Let's go check it out. The building as a whole is so important to the community. It's one of only four libraries in the country, five in the world that Andrew Carnegie endowed. Um, it's a beautiful building. It has rich history. It has rich architecture. Before we restored the post, I used to say, um, move over Oakland, move over Squirrel Hill, move over Carnegie Hall in New York. We are the Carnegie Carnegie with an acoustically superb music hall that's literally located where Broadway meets Main Street. The foot of our hill is Broadway in Maine. That didn't even include the ESPY post. Well, I am a deep convert. The story literally went around the world. I have a copy of the Peninsula, which is the English language daily printed in Qatar on the Arabian Peninsula, saying, library hides labyrinths of history. I have great faith in this organization, in this facility, in the community support of it. But I know in my marrow that the thing that sets us apart from any other building in the country is that Grand Army of the Republic post. Nobody else anywhere has anything like it. So we are here at the Captain Thomas Espy Post, and we are here with the curator, John Eric Gillot. And besides being the curator of the Captain Thomas Espy Post, you're also an archivist at the Diocese of Wheeling, Charleston. Correct. And just as a funny coincidence, my father happens to be uh, an archivist of the Diocese of Pittsburgh, and he knows you, I think. When I, when I lived and worked here in Pittsburgh, your dad was a client of mine. Really? And then when I took my job down in Wheeling, he became a colleague. So I've known your dad a long time. And I think my sister was in the position before you down. She was your... one, one of my predecessors, yeah. yes. So it's small world here. Yes, but we are actually here not to talk about my dad and the archives, but we are here to talk about the Captain Thomas Espy Post. So tell us a little bit about the history of this post. So this post started at what year? The Espy Post was founded in 1879. Our charter, I'm not sure if you can see it on the camera, the charter is right behind us, but New Year's Eve, 1879, um, down in Lower Town, Carnegie. At that time, Carnegie didn't exist. It was two communities, okay. Mansfield and Chartiers, on either side of Chartiers Creek. Those two communities incorporated together in 1894 and took the name Carnegie in honor of Andrew Carnegie. Yeah. yeah, and but this library didn't even exist at this time. It's sort of, they were doing these 
meetings in what random halls or yeah rented spaces wherever they could find space to meet around town and you know by the turn of the century when this library did open a little over 120 years ago yeah. um, these guys were getting older at that point they're in their 60s they're getting tired of kind of schlepping their records and their stuff from place to place wherever they could meet so they were looking for a permanent home and they thought that they had found that here at the Andrew Carnegie Free Library Museum. and that was in 1906 that they 1906 came here. they approached the library and they forged an agreement with the library with a few stipulations. One was that the veterans would pay to outfit this room. So everything that you see in here was paid for by the veterans. The woodwork, the display cases, the lighting, the carpeting, the furniture, that all came from the veterans. Um, the other part of the stipulation was that the veterans would have free rent for as long as they wanted to meet here yeah. with the understanding that when the last veteran died, everything that was in this room would be turned over to the library and preserved for future generations as a testament for the bravery and their sacrifices during the Civil War. And that sort of didn't exactly happen when the last person died. They didn't exactly adhere to that agreement. Uh, they did keep the room here, but it wasn't especially well preserved at first. The, the library definitely fell on hard times. The endowment did not last, the endowment that Mr. Carnegie had set up. There was a point in the 1980s where after making payroll, there was only $136 left in the coffers wow. here at the library. So we're doing much better today, but uh, the, you know, the focus of this was as a library, as a music hall and entertainment venue. Um, so the, the Civil, Civil War room, they knew it was here, uh, but it was, I guess, a little secondary in importance at that time. About in 1990, they started to be a little more concerned with room. Like the mid 1980s, it was rediscovered by uh, Mike Krause, who's curator at Soldiers and Sailors. And um, yeah, Maggie was hired a little later, uh, but she has been a driving force with securing the money for restoration. But the room was rediscovered in the mid 1980s, and that's yeah. where a group of guys started to get involved, um, raise some money, raise some awareness. So yeah. we can so, talk about that. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about some of these artifacts in this room. Like, for example, this is one of the artifacts you wanted to talk about. Tell us a little bit about this artifact. Sure, so this is the ballot box of the Captain Thomas Espy Post. And uh, you know, the Grand Army of the Republic was open to all honorably discharged Union veterans from okay. the Civil War. But just being a Union Army veteran did not automatically qualify you for membership. So if you were presented for membership, the members of the post here would put together what was called a committee of three. And they would go out into the neighborhood and they would investigate your character. They wanted ah. to make sure that you weren't going to carouse around town or get drunk and beat your wife, things like that. Um, they, they might even bring you into the post here to interrogate you about your wartime service, make sure wow. that you were who you said you are. So um, at that point then, they would take the ballot box, each, each member would get a white ball and a black ball, and they would vote. And one black ball for every three white balls was good enough to disqualify you from wow. membership. And if you were disqualified from membership or not accepted as a member of this post, you couldn't just go down the road to the next one and try to join there because there were 30 posts like this in Allegheny County. There were more than 600 in Pennsylvania, more than 7,500 across the United States. But they would publish your name in what was called the Black Book you of were Rejection. Blacklisted. You were blacklisted. You were blackballed. Yes. Black, uh, so we have a white and a black ball. Should we? See if you should be a member. Go ahead. I'll vote for you. You'll vote okay. for me. Okay, John Eric for membership. Yeah, I think Thank you deserve you. the membership. But so what, besides drunkenness, was in other post or in this post, were you ever rejected for something such as race? So unfortunately, that did happen. Uh, the Grand Army of the Republic was not by rule or by law a segregated organization, but segregation certainly did exist. Many of the African-American veterans would be uh, not accepted for membership at local posts. Uh, so in places like Pittsburgh, where you had the uh, uh, Colonel Shaw post in the Hill District, that was an all African-American post that met there. Um, in essentially because these guys were maybe being rejected from other posts. But the SB post was an integrated post. We had at least three or four African-American veterans that we know of that you can see in the uh, image of the veterans on the front step. So we are proud that uh, very early on that this post was unique and that it was an integrated Grand Army of the Republic post. Yeah, that's awesome. So let's yes. go check out that picture. Okay. So, John Eric, tell me about this particular picture here. What is this a picture of? 
So this photograph was presented to the Post in March 1906 when they moved into the library, taken on the front steps of the library. But the photo was actually taken two years earlier on Decoration Day, or today Memorial Day as we know of, in 1904. Uh, but this is um, an interesting example of early Photoshop, I guess. How so? Uh, so in the original photo, which we'll show you, uh, up here in the uh, window, which is just across the hall from us, there were two young ladies there who were working on, I think, a bean soup supper for these veterans. And they were removed from this blown up image. But also you can notice that several of the heads here in the back row have a little different sheen to them. And those were guys who uh, might not have been here on the day that the original image was taken and their heads were added in after. No Adobe Photoshop back then. No. No. All right. Well, this is a really cool picture. And uh, you said, as you were saying about the integrated thing, we have a couple African-Americans here. Right. We have been able to uh, identify several of the African-American veterans in the post. Uh, as well as this gentleman here, who we know is Jonathan Greenwich, uh, identified by some of his descendants who still live locally. Uh, obviously very fair-skinned. Uh, we had not uh, anticipated that that was one of our African-American veterans, um, but we, d we do have quite a bit of information on him now. And his family was good enough to donate his pre-war Kentucky long rifle oh, nice. and some information about him, which is on display right outside the SB Post today. But is, if there was an actual meeting in the Post, you just had only, only the... Only open to members. Okay. Interesting. And we know from post minutes that uh, while there were 200 members that belonged to this post at various times, um, your average meeting here, they would meet twice a month. And we know that the average meeting would have anywhere from 12 to 15 to maybe 20 guys that would have been here in this room conducting the business of the SB Post. Yeah, it would be pretty hard, I think, to get 200 people in this room. Right. So speaking of Thomas Espy, shall we go and look at Captain Thomas Espy? Sure. So we're over here with the portrait of Thomas Espy. So I want to ask you a little bit about Thomas Espy. So why did they, what would make somebody decide to name a post after a particular soldier? Well, it was, um, it was in fashion at that time to name posts like this after, uh, you know, officers or men who had died during the war or famous generals or politicians of the war. Uh, so many of the men that belonged to this post had served under Espy, and they thought very highly of him and wanted to honor him in some way. And he was kind of old when he joined the Civil War. I mean, you know, you think young people would join, but he was what? In his 50s. In his early 50s, yes. So he certainly would not have been required to enlist yeah. to fight in the war. So um, we know that he was doing this for you know patriotic motives, uh, perhaps to free the slaves. We don't know exactly what his motives were, but he could have very easily stayed home and sat out the Civil War. And he ultimately ended up paying the ultimate sacrifice by going and fighting during the war. He had some sort of a mill or something. He did. He was from uh, Upper St. Clair. He yeah. was kind of a wealthy grist mill owner, kind of a prosperous guy. Prior to the war, he was captain of the St. Clair Guards, which was a local militia company. Um, at the outbreak of the Civil War, he enlisted that company as Company H of the 62nd Pennsylvania. That uh, regiment was sent to Harrisburg and ultimately ended up in the Army of the Potomac. So fighting in some of the famous battles that you think of during the Civil War. Espy made it as far as the Virginia Peninsula on July in July 1862, where he was mortally wounded at the Battle of Gaines Mill. Uh, he was left on the field and captured by the Confederates and died there several days later. He's buried in one of the unknown graves at either uh, Gaines Mill or Cold Harbor National Cemetery. So he did not make it home, uh, but many of the men from this post fought with SB, continued on uh, throughout the war, survived the war, and came back here to Carnegie and wanted to honor him. lot of interesting little artifacts here in this case. Is there any stories associated with anything that you want to tell us? Yeah, so in addition to being their meeting room, these guys also made it their personal museum. They had the foresight 
to uh, publish a catalog here in 1911 where they numbered and identified each piece in the room. So we have in the veteran's own words, what made all of this stuff significant? Who carried it during the war? Who collected it after? These guys were big into their curios. It almost looks like they were junkers. You see like bits of cotton and a, a, a twist of the uh, tobacco and bricks and kind of random things. But a lot of these pieces did have a uh, personal meaning to several of the veterans. Also from the Civil War. Right, many of them uh, you know, carried through the war, brought home by these guys or collected after the war on their travels to visit the battlefields of their youth. Okay, and you said that you said there, there was a nice story with this particular bullet. What is this number? 161? Sure, number one sixty one. Uh, this bullet, uh, which we'll take out of the case so we can get a better look at, um, but that was that bullet actually wounded one of the members of this post, a guy by the name of John Boyce. He was from Bridgeville. He enlisted early in the war in Company K of the First Pennsylvania Cavalry. They were known as the Bridgeville Lancers. There were seven of his brothers or his cousins who served in the company with him, wow. but in late in November 1863, he was wounded at the Battle of New Hope Church, Virginia, and this bullet uh, entered his leg and, and coming out the other side had lost enough velocity that it couldn't make it through his pants. And so it fell down into his boot. And when he, when he made it to the hospital, uh, when his boot and his pants were removed, the bullet dropped out onto the floor and he had the foresight to keep it. Yeah. And he carried it with him for the rest of the war and brought it here to the SB post where um, Earlier this summer, a few of his descendants came in, had no idea that this bullet was here, and they were able to see this piece of soft lead that, you know, just going a few inches in another direction might have ended their ancestor's life, and maybe they wouldn't be they here would be today. Here. So besides these artifacts, we also have um, actual clothing. These are actual clothes from the Civil War. Right. Uh, this was a uniform that was worn by uh, Lieutenant Samuel Drake of the 77th Pennsylvania, who belonged here to the post after the war. Uh, the uniform is in outstanding condition, uh, primarily because Drake did not receive his commission until late in the war. So he only wore this for several months. But during the war, officers were required to purchase their own uniforms. If you were a grunt, a regular enlisted man, your uniform was provided. But if you were an officer, you had to pay for your own uniform. We know Drake had a little bit of money because on the back of his buttons here, they are all marked Tiffany and Company, wow. New York, New York. Uh, so a fabulous uh, 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 officer's frock coat here with his sword. Uh, actually, several years ago, the National Park Service came in to inspect this uniform because it is in such good condition. And I believe they had a reproduction made based off of this coat. Oh, that's really awesome. And there's there are a lot of weapons around the room. There's guns, there's swords, and so forth. Um, so these are all equipment that people had in the battle that was somehow brought home with them or brought sent. home with them or collect or sent home or collected after the war but yes uh, uniforms flags arms drums accoutrements uh, and then little curios that they collected along the way also like the uh the canteen here that was plucked out of a tree in fredericksburg virginia where a wasp's nest had grown around it where it had been hanging for several decades off the wow. battlefield and was discovered during a later visit wow all this in carnegie pa right right in your own backyard so I want to talk a little bit about the restoration. Um, tell me a little bit about how they did that, because I believe, didn't they take great pains to make sure that they made it exactly the way the room was originally made. Right. So uh, when the room was rediscovered, there was quite a bit of damage. You had plaster falling off the walls from water damage. There was an inch of that black Pittsburgh soot from the atmosphere that had settled on everything. The walls were bleached white. You couldn't see any color in here. So we did take great pains during the restoration process for the color that you see on the wall that we refer to as like a pumpkin, pumpkin. pie, pumpkin yeah. chiffon. Um, that was a core sample that was taken from behind the radiator and sent out for testing where they determined that this was the original color of the room. The original carpet was in tatters. So we did find locally, we were able to source this almost exact replica of the carpet that was here. Uh, lighting, uh, we took uh, great pains and as well as uh, 
a climate control system. You know, so many of our artifacts in here are organic. They really need uh, stable uh, relative humidity and temperature. So we're able to provide that year round now to help care for these artifacts. Can you tell us a little bit about how people can come and see the room? And maybe especially if they want to like have a tour with you, how do, can they do that? Sure, so the SB Post is open every Saturday, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. I have a crew of docents who love giving tours of the room. So they are here every Saturday for four hours. But if, if Saturday isn't a good day for you, you can always contact us at the library and we will make sure that someone is here to give you a private tour. Uh, but additionally, we like to bring more people up here to the hilltop and on the second Saturday of every month, January through June and September through November, uh, in the Lincoln Gallery, right next door to us here, we have the second Saturday Civil War Lecture Series, where I bring in authors and historians, uh, National Park Service rangers from all over the country to come and give lectures about various aspects of the Civil War. And then each April, on the second Saturday of April, so April 13th, 2024, we have a one-day Civil War Symposium where we bring in five speakers wow. and we have lunch and book sales and raffles and all kinds of good stuff. Excellent. Well, thank you again, John Eric. We really appreciate you being here with us today and talking to us about the Captain Thomas Espy Post. Thanks for coming, Wendy. And certainly, I believe that the Civil War was the defining chapter in our nation's history. Um, we have lessons to learn. To make sure that their sacrifices, the sacrifices of their comrades, their friends, their brothers, their cousins, their fathers who went off to fight and didn't come home, they wanted to make sure that they were remembered and that their sacrifices were honored.